Well, this evening, uh, we have uh, 26, 36 minutes. I had two short questions. I'm going to run through them, and then we'll have the microphones open. Uh, the first question that was emailed to me was, would you give a brief or a thumbnail, thumbnail, uh, on why Calvary Bible is a rapture-believing church versus uh, the uh, pre-wrath view. Um, why that? And they said, would you give a thumbnail? Actually, it was a four-page question. And uh, they asked me to give a thumbnail. So I thought, okay, that's, I love challenges. And the second one, oh, um, again, just a, a brief uh, thumbnail on, so a thumbnail. I just want to remind myself, a thumbnail on our people who do not believe in creationism, in other words, in six-day literal everything from nothing, ex nihilo, you know, what it says in the Bible. Are those people who do not believe that, are they apostates? So basically, the first one is, um, the thumbnail would be, why do I personally believe in the rapture? And the second one would be is, what is an apostate? Th that would be if I was answering those briefly. So. Um, uh, rapture is the first one. And uh, I always think in terms of references, so I'll just give you the references that come to my mind. Uh, John 14, uh, 1 Thessalonians, of course, 4 and 5, uh, and 2 Thessalonians 1, and then uh, Acts 1. So let's just go through those uh, for the rapture. Uh, I, I mean, personally, I don't know if you know, the, the pre-wrath rapture view is actually just a, uh, a restatement of, of a historic position. It was called the mid-tribulational view. It's also been called um, other things over the years. But let's start in John 14. And basically, for some of you who, uh, I have to always remember that there are some people that don't know Christian speak. You know, I mean, you haven't grown up uh, in the church, so you don't know what we're talking about. And rapture is a word that's not in the Bible. Uh, actually, the word that's in the Bible is a Greek word, uh, harpazo. Um, harpazo, yeah. Uh, that's not what it looks like. That's just a, um, you know, a, a anglicized version of it. This word is the word that's used when Philip was sent by the Lord to intersect the Ethiopian eunuch, if you remember that in Acts chapter 8. And uh, the eunuch, Philip, was walking, and the eunuch comes driving along from Jerusalem in his chariot, going back to Ethiopia. And as he's going along, he had purchased the big scroll of Isaiah, which means the guy was loaded. Uh, anybody could buy that thing, which took, you know, a long time to copy. And he was up in his chariot, and he was reading it. And in the ancient world, I don't know if you realize, people didn't read silently. Books, manuscripts, uh, scrolls were so rare that, that people read aloud or had reading read to them so that others could hear. And so he, the reason Philip knew where he was reading was he came up and listened because reading was allowed. Because reading is it, literally the, the Greek word for reading is to know again what the person knew that wrote this. And so Reading wasn't, you know, I mean, we see words everywhere. I mean, there's flashing signs and the billboards change and, and we're just inundated in messages and everything else. And so to us, reading is, is almost a labor because there's too many things to read. It was so precious back then that their goal was to know again what the person knew when uh, they wrote it. And that's why the Ethiopian eunuch says, uh, understand us out, or Philip said, understand us out, do you know what he was writing? And so after he finished leading him to the Lord and baptizing him, it says he was caught away. Philip was. By the Holy Spirit, 
he was in the city of Gaza, which is, of course, you know where that is because of the news. It's down uh, along the coast on the way to Egypt, and he was found in Azotus. That means that, that God literally took him from one place and put him in another place. That word is this word, and that's the word that Paul said that we will be taken in, from where we are into the Lord's presence. So let's look at how that happens and why uh, Calvary Bible and myself believe in uh, the biblical rapture um, in chapter 14. Now, most people talk about this. In fact, I, I was in, uh, if you've ever heard of uh, Marv Rosenthal or if you've ever heard of uh, uh, Van Camp and Merritt, the company that owns Xerox, uh, I remember sitting in the 80s uh, while I was on uh, faculty at the Master's Seminary, and uh, Bob Van Campen, who owns Xerox Corporation, wrote a two-year Bible study uh, about the, the pre-wrath rapture view and gave it to Marv Rosenthal, who later published it in his own name, if you've ever read his works. It was actually Bob Van Campen that, that wrote it. But I remember sitting and listening by the hour with all the faculty of the Master's Seminary, and they got into uh, such complexities that most people uh, would have just, I mean, started checking their email because it was so hard to explain the positions. And so I, I like to think simply. And so I'll look at John 14. Jesus is saying in verse 1, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. That's a sad translation. That's New King James. Actually, it doesn't mean, you know, like Dolly Parton mansions, you know, down there in Nashville. We're not talking about that. Uh, not Texan oil mansions. It's one house and many rooms. So we're living in our father's house in our room under his roof. And so in my father's house are many, and that word mansions uh, actually is used outside of this passage for nests. Birds have nests. You know, um, if, if you have a chicken coop, you know, the chicken has its own little place it sits, you know, its, its spot. That's what this word is. So we each have a spot in our Father's house. If it were not so, I would have told you. Now here, here it is. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Um, what he's talking about here, it's very interesting. The rapture, as is discussed uh, here at Calvary and in literature, popular literature, is Jesus, <clears throat> excuse me, coming for believers. And I like to say, now Zig, watch out, I'm going to cough. <coughs> excuse me. I don't want to amplify my cough here. Um, I believe that, that uh, Bonnie always tells me, honey, that's confusing, don't say that. Honey, that's confusing, don't say that. I, I heard you say that. I believe that there are two, two raptures. One is the most commonly repeated one where Jesus comes to where one of his saints are at the instant of their death. Now, I want you to think about this for a second. David said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou, capital T, you, God, are with me. If you couple that, Psalm 23, 4, with what it says in Hebrews chapter 9, it's appointed unto us once to die. God does not send angels. God actually sends his son, our Savior, to come and take us home because of this promise. I go and prepare a place for you. And Jesus coming for believers is a very personal, uh, in fact, uh, I personally have uh, performed over 300 funerals. I stopped counting, kind of like that book, My First 300 Babies. I did my first 300 funerals, and I've stopped counting since then. But I always tell the families this. I say, as when I'm sitting with them, 
I say, what time did, uh, did grandma die? What time did your dad die? What time did your wife stop breathing and, and you knew that, that she had died? And they look at the clock and they say, oh, you know, 227. I said, you know what? I know exactly where in the whole universe Jesus Christ was at 227. He came because he had prepared a place. And I will come. Look what it says. I will come. I'm in, in um, verse 3. I go, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. The, the rapture, number one, is the personal one. The First Thessalonians 4 one is a group. That's where Jesus takes all of us who are alive and remain to be gathered unto him. Same word right here. Uh, this, this, oh, I left the R out. There we go. No one told me that. I thought it didn't look right. Harpazo. It's like harpazo. Harpazo. This snatching out is being taken from one spot to somewhere else. Here in John 14, the context is, I'm preparing a place for you, verse 2. Since I'm going to prepare a place for you, when the place is done, I'm going to receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. I remember Willard Heck was his name, founder of New Life Ranch and Tulsa Bible Church. He used to always sit by the column that held up the balcony in that original building we used to be in. And he got so old and weak that he ended up leaning on the column. He couldn't even sit up straight. He was not strong enough, but he never missed church. And he would always be seen leaned from toppling over on that column. And I remember talking to him as he finally couldn't even come to church and he was in the hospital his last days until he died of uh, emphysema or something along that line. And, and tears ran down his face. And he said, my whole life, I have waited for the rapture. My whole life, I thought I was going to get to go in the rapture. And he just, I mean, my heart went out to him. It was so sweet, pastor to pastor, and he just wept. And I said, Willard, you are going in the rapture. You get the personal one, the private rapture. Everybody else has to wait for the bus. You are going <laughs> escorted, personally taken, by the Lord Jesus Christ who's coming because your place is prepared. And I want you to know, if you get to choose between, I mean, which one do you think is better? Would you rather get on a bus or would you rather have a private, escorted walk through the valley of the shadow of death? And it was so sweet. He said, oh, you're just, you know, he said, you're just doing that. I said, no, that's what I believe. So rapture, this is what Bonnie says. I'm not saying that there are going to be two raptures because that's a whole different view. That's called Christian triumphalism and they believe that the people that go in the first rapture are only the ones that are really living for the Lord and the rest need to kind of go through purgatory of the tribulation for a while and if they get it together, they get to go in the second coming of Christ. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about at death, Jesus Christ comes to personally take believers to be with him because he's prepared a place for them. And that means that if you wonder why you, you, we have many senior citizens that get to a point where they're so weak, so limited, so in pain, they say, why does the Lord let me stay? And I always tell them the same thing. Write what it says. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come and receive you to myself. You know what's implied? When your place is ready. And so if we are struggling with uh, uh, physical infirmities and the Lord has not come or come to take us home, then it's because like Anna in the account of Christ's birth, we need to serve him by prayer and by fasting. And those are the two things uh, that the older you get, you can do. Fasting because you don't have any appetite and you're not hungry and nothing agrees with you, and prayer because you can't sleep anyway. And so you just pray and fast and pray and fast and, and glorify God that way. But let's talk about the group event. 
Uh, John 14 talks about uh, the, the coming of Christ. 1 Thessalonians 4, you already know this, but let's just look at it. I mean, the wording of what, what we're talking about. The rapture, which is Christ receiving his church unto himself. Uh, these are the words. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 onward. I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as those who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. Verse 16, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be, and that word caught up is that word harpazo right there, caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus shall we always be with the Lord, therefore comfort one another, and keep reading down through chapter 5 to verse 9, the, the, the second reference there, 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 9 right here, uh, says the second pillar, as it were, of the uh, rapture is, God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, whether we live or die, we should live together with him, comfort one another. You notice again, the, the idea of Christ's coming was comfort, not you're going to have to endure all the horrors of the Antichrist, and if you survive after you've endured that, then uh, I'm going to come get you. And then look at the second coming of Christ, the description. It's in across the page in 2 Thessalonians 1, and uh, verse 8, just across the page. This, this is the second coming. Now see, what we have to do uh, is contrast, and, and the, the rapture, if you notice, uh, is uh, Jesus uh, coming. He's in the clouds. Uh, we're caught up into the air. Uh, and uh, into the air, caught up to be with him. And that's the rapture, that's the, the uh, John 14 and 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5 comfort. So it's a comforting thing. Now the second coming, look at 2 Thessalonians 1, 8, the second coming. What, what is that? Well, it's in flaming fire. See what it says? Um, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And, and it talks about the, the coming of Christ, uh, which is hearkening onto Revelation 19, when at his second coming, that is the second coming. Revelation 19 talks about the second coming coming. Uh, it's the same one that Matthew 24 talks about and Matthew 26 talks about, which talks about him coming on the clouds and everybody mourning and, and people crawling underneath, you know, trying to hide from him coming and the fiery vengeance and all that. So the second coming, he touches down. If you if you actually read uh, Zechariah, he touches down. Zechariah 12 and 14 tells us where he lands on the Mount of Olives. And when he lands, there's this massive earthquake that splits the mountain, and, and it causes global topographical, uh, geological, and geographic changes. And he consumes all the armies and that fire and everything else and immediately sets up this dividing of the sheep and goats and, and, and we know all that. So there is quite a difference between this and this. Now back, you all, this is only review. Look at this. See, this is what's so neat. I don't need to go into the tenses of some Greek word and try and compare Daniel to this and that. Look what Acts 1 says. This 
when people talk about the hope, the blessed hope, in, in Titus, Paul continues this idea, and in Titus 2 he says, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. What is that? That's in Acts chapter 1. Um, it says, um, verse 9, now when he had spoken these things, Acts 1, 9, they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Now, we've already talked about that. I mean, that, that was in our Titus 2 when we looked at that and, and talked about how Jesus left the earth. Luke 24 tells us he was blessing the disciples verbally. He's saying, Peter, Peter, you're amazing. Keep on. Don't forget what I taught you. Keep your foot out of your mouth, Peter. You know, don't, and Thomas, hold on. Don't doubt anymore. Uh, John, you know. And he was just blessing them and, and just giving his blessings to each of the, the apostles that were there. And as he was blessing, raining down blessings on them, it said he began to rise. See what it says? And while, when he had spoken these things, in, in, in Luke 24, says while he was speaking these things, actually he's still talking, and he starts rising up, and, and they're looking up at him, watching him rise from the Mount of Olives. And he was taken up out of their sight until a cloud, you know, kind of disappeared in the clouds and went away. And while they just kept watching, you know, hoping he'd come right back because they loved it best when he was there, behold, two men stood by them, in verse 10, in white apparel, which also said, uh, Vir Galil, that's what the Latin says. There's a church called that. They actually have built a church on this spot, Vir Galil, uh, men of Galilee. Uh, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? Now, this is what I wanted you to get to, verse 11. This same Jesus who was taken up from you. Here's, here's the rapture. You don't need to try and squeeze what Paul said into what Jesus said in Matthew 24. This is the, the final word. Jesus just went up blessing them, raining down blessings only seen by believers. Did you think about that? After the resurrection, Jesus was never seen except by loving eyes. He was never touched except by loving hands. Jesus only spent time with believers after his resurrection. He didn't go around and show off to the Roman soldiers that they didn't do a good job crucifying him, you know, he, that he was alive. He only was seen by believing eyes and touched by believing hands. But look what it says, verse 11. This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner. So the angels explain the second the, the, the return of Christ, the second coming of Christ for believers. And the more you study this, there are two, two, dis, two completely differently described second comings. The like manner for believers, the angels said in verse 11, believers, the second coming of Christ is going to be just like his ascension. What was it like? It was only for believers. It was a blessing. It was uh, uh, Jesus coming in a way that comforted them. That, that Remember, he says, you know, don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't worry about this. He blessed them on his way. Just the way you saw him go into heaven you're going to see him return the same way. That's why it began to be known as, in Titus, back up here, in Titus 2, right there, it began to be known as the blessed hope of the believers. What is the blessed hope? Not that we're going to endure the, the greatest outpouring 
outpouring of deception and of, of Satan on overdrive and having the false Christ uh, that, that is coming as you read about in Revelation. But that the one who went to prepare a place for us is going to come and receive us and bring with him all the saints whose bodies are going to come out of the ground and be, uh, they are going to be, their bodies resurrected and our bodies changed in that instant. So they and us will get, 1 Corinthians 15 says, our bodies at the same time. So, one last thing, because this is only supposed to be a thumbnail. Uh, need uh, to work on that description. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, because... Um, now do you see why it was a four-page email? Because uh, there's a lot of details. But uh, Paul said this in 1 Thessalonians uh, 15. What I didn't mark this. Uh, Behold, I show you mystery. We shall not all sleep. What verse is that? Say it again. 51. There we go. Thank you. Who said that? Good job. Elizabeth, right? I thought I could see you through the lights. 51, behold, I show you a mystery. I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we all shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of the eye at the last trumpet. The trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. And on and on he goes. This, so, so this is the first time that this event is mentioned. A mystery means it was heretofore not previously revealed. So, this doctrine is classified in the Bible as a mystery. In other words, you can't find it in the Old Testament. And you also can't find it in the Gospels. And the question that, that Dave Scott asked, you know, a couple weeks ago, what about Peter saying, you know, and Jesus telling him that, that he's going to be crucified upside down, you know, they're going to stretch out your arms and carry you where you don't want to go, and they're going to do what you don't want them to do to you, which was predicting his death, then how could Peter have believed in the any moment return of Christ? Because when Jesus talked in John 14, they didn't understand what he was talking about. They just heard it. They, they weren't processing all this stuff. Jesus was telling them truth that would not be understood until Paul, in 1 Corinthians 15, says, let me clarify this. This is something that wasn't pre... Jesus did not comment. Now, you can look back, and you can see the rapture all the way through the Old Testament. I mean, it's, it's so, so interesting. Uh, at the flood, there was someone uh, that was taken out prior to the flood there was someone that was preserved through the flood and there was everyone that was destroyed by the flood Enoch represents the church Noah represents Israel that are kept through the tribulation and the world is the world I mean the same is true of, of Lot being dragged out of Sodom and, and Sodom being destroyed, but before the destruction, Lot was pulled out. I mean, you can see all these things that, that you can read into them, but uh, personally, the reason I believe in the rapture is because Jesus said that he's going to prepare a place and come and get us. He, Paul describes it as a mystery, and Jesus said what believers look forward to is the personal coming of Jesus Christ to receive us unto himself. So that's my thumbnail. Uh, I'm glad that's all they asked for, is a thumbnail. Uh, let me go to the second question, which was, and, and I will go shorter on this one. Uh, if you do not believe in creation, um, uh, not believing in creation, not a creationist, does that equal an apostate? Because if it does, uh, there's another view that I'm going to try and do next Sunday night, which someone, I mean, these are all just want a thumbnail. Uh, next Sunday night, they said, um, is there something between Genesis 1-1 and 
two that you can put all of the dinosaurs and cavemen, which is called the gap theory. You know, the gap theory um, between Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2. God created everything and there was, it was without form and void. So obviously there was this huge satanic battle and, and all the first creation was all messed up by Satan and God buried it and all those people were crushed in the animals and everything, there's this gap. And between 1-1 one, one and 1-2 one, are, you know, billions of years and everything. Well, who, th who believed in all that? A whole galaxy of Christians. The gap theory, uh, Chalmers uh, wrote about it. G.H. Uh, uh, Pember wrote about it. Um, Earth's Earliest Ages, it was called. Uh, the Schofield Bible, if you've ever heard of the Schofield Bible, I mean, there, there are so many people that believed in this gap theory, but were not apostates. Um, and so th that's next week. How did we get on that? What we're talking about is, what is an apostate? Okay, what is an apostate? And if you want to know what an apostate is, there's three passages of Scripture. I mean, there are many, but three key ones. Second uh, Peter 2, Jude and 1st John is filled with uh, references about apostates. So let's just go to 2nd Peter 2 and define what an apostate is in our last nine minutes. So this will truly be a thumbnail. 2nd uh, Peter 2, uh, verse 1, there were false prophets among the teachers, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them. Number one, the chief description of these apostates is they deny the Lord's redemptive work. They deny either his resurrection, his bodily resurrection, the substitutionary, uh, the vicarious atonement. They just deny something to do with the, the Lord's uh, death, uh, burial, and resurrection. And it says, uh, and many will follow, verse 2, their destructive ways uh, because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. Not they'll hold an unusual view of some doctrine, which was what I would, you know, I mean, as much as I love Ken Ham and Answers in Genesis, creationism is not the litmus test for salvation. It's important. It does, it does change your whole view of the Bible, but there are many people that have not truly thought about what they're saying, and they would never deny the scriptures but they are going along with a crowd. And, and uh, if this wasn't a thumbnail, I would spend the whole night talking about how many ways all of us go along with the crowd. But look at what it says, what apostates are like. Verse 4, If God did not spare angels who sinned, but cast them down into hell, and put them in the chains of darkness, and he didn't, share, didn't spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, verse 5, and turned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, but he delivered righteous Lot, righteous lot I'm glad that's in there I didn't even think he was saved you know if you read Genesis you wonder the guy is incestuous living in the midst of homosexuals uh, with no compunction wow but it says here lot was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked for that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day seeing and hearing their lawless deeds, which shows how we can have compassion on the homosexuals and be tormented and, and hurt by their sin, and, and it vex our souls. But it doesn't mean that, that we uh, vilify them. You notice that, that there's a compassion uh, that we're supposed to have component, and this shows how it works. We can be righteous, we can dwell among them and be tormented, by their lawless deeds. But the Lord knows how to deliver us out of temptation. But now look at verse 12. He starts talking about the apostates again. But these are like natural brute beasts. They're made to be caught and destroyed. They speak evil of things they don't understand. They utterly perish in their own corruption. Uh, they carouse in the daytime. You think that, that, that people that don't believe in creationism are carousing in the daytime in gross immorality? No. They are spots and blemishes. 
Uh, while they feast with you, they have eyes full of adultery. They can't cease from sin. Uh, these are, verse 17, wells without water. That means that they've never been regenerated. they are clouds carried by the tempest. That means they have no biblical moorings. For whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Just because someone doesn't believe in a strict, literal, 168-hour creation week does not instantly put them into 2 Peter 2. It makes them not dealing correctly with the whole counsel of God. But it's the same true for people that believe uh, that are amillennial. I mean, 28% of the Bible is about the millennium. Does that mean that they are apostates just because, you know, uh, they don't believe the full counsel of God? And if you go to Jude, it's the same thing. Uh, if you go after 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, uh, Jude describes them again. Uh, Woe to them, verse 11, they've gone in the way of Cain, they've run greedily in the air of Balaam for profit. These are all uh, metaf you know, biographical insights. Cain wanted to, he denied the blood uh, bloody sacrifice of a lamb. He wanted to offer, you know, garden produce. He didn't want the uh, kind of like liberalism today, which is apostate, that doesn't want the blood of Christ. Don't talk about it. It's, it's you know, Albert Schweitzer-esque, you know. We don't want to talk about that. It's messy. Uh, they've run greedily in the area of Balaam. Remember, Balaam wanted to die the death of the righteous. He didn't want to live the life of the righteous, kind of like those, uh, I can sin all I want. Uh, that side of apostasy. There's no Holy Spirit conviction of sin. They perished in the rebellion of Korah. They're rebels. Um, same wording as Second Peter, verse 12. There's spots in your love feasts. Uh, they, they without fear serve only themselves. They're self-centered. They're clouds without water. They do not have that life-giving water. The Holy Spirit is not within them. They're carried about by the winds. They have no doctrinal mooring. They're late autumn trees without fruit, so there's no fruit of salvation in their lives. Twice dead, pulled up by the roots. Raging waves of the sea foaming up. I mean, this is what an apostate is. They are wandering stars. I love that. Wandering stars. What is wandering stars? The, the Greek word is very interesting. Planes. You all know. Um, planes. We have an English word, planets, from that. To the ancients, there were two things. There were the dots in the skies that never moved. I mean, they stayed in the same place, even though as the season, they stayed together and moved, you know, the constellations. So those were stars. And then there were planets, the planets that moved among the stars and were not fixed. They were not moored. And that planes, planao, planeo, that whole word is what he's talking about, wandering stars. They're not fixed to doctrine of Christ or anything else. To whom is reserved? Those are the apostates, the ones who are not fixed on doctrine. To whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever? And on and on he goes. So the thumbnail. I do not see, described in the scriptures under apostasy, someone who has a different view on eschatology, which means their, uh, their view of pre, mid, post, or non, whatever, you know, all the arguments, that does not make them apostate, nor does someone who thinks that God created, but they kind of add, like the, the Genesis 1, 1, and 1, 2 gap people, uh, or those that posture that God did it over a long time. Just that is not biblically defined as an apostate. Now you say, oh, but what about Revelation or Romans 5, where it says, you know, sin entered the world through Adam. Yeah, that is a really big problem. And what about Jesus? When Jesus talked about the first humans, he didn't talk about uh, you know, the, the group that he had to drown and bury between verses 1 and 2. He said the first human was Adam. When Jesus described creation, he described it the way it's written in the Bible. So I don't know how anybody cannot believe in biblical creationism, but I do know a lot of dear brothers in Christ who do not believe in six-day biblical creationism. But it would be very hard for them to be apostates. 
by the definition of the Bible, maybe by the definition of people that are really strong creationists, but not by the definition of Peter and Paul and Jude and Jesus. They did not go that far, so I have trouble going that far. And I'm going to let you out one minute early. Let's all stand. Uh, aren't you glad that, um, that those were thumbnails, you know, and uh, not too long? And so I'm sorry that Les had to set up the microphones and all of you were ready to talk, but next week I will try and do a short on the gap, you know, the gap theory and, uh, and even why it's such an interesting view, and then we'll have time for the microphones, Lord willing. But let's bow together for a word of prayer. Father, you saved us with a purpose to glorify you. And your love constrains us, Paul said, to no longer live for ourselves, but to live unto you. And if we knew that either you were going to come to take us into your presence, your church in the rapture, or you were going to call us home sometime tomorrow, how would we measure the moments we had left? Who would we want to spend time with? Who would we talk to? How fervently would we share our hope in Christ? That's the one thing the early church had on us, they did live each day like it was their last day. I pray we'd have that expectancy growing in our hearts, even wanting, as uh, Phil reminded us, to deliver these invitations. What a blessing if all 5,000 of our invitations to Passion Week could be lovingly passed out with our hands as your instruments and our voices as your witnesses. How I pray that we would try and live by your grace, through your Spirit's power, more and more of our days like they were our very last one and live it for you. Thanks for letting us gather. May we be surrounded by your grace as we go out into this world to live for you. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray and all God's people said, amen. God bless you as you go.